of yeah, I was such a fraud. <laughs> Because you mean a lot to me, I got the book and I read. But before anything else, before anything else, you can see the, um, the little picture, thumbprint, thumbnail of the video. But I, I just, you just saw it right now. This thing that, that the press or Harry, whatever, are putting, it's not the real text exchange. And the reason it's being done that way is so Harry and Meghan can claim deniability, just like they're doing with the race thing. That text conversation never existed, not in that way. That thing that's going, doing the rounds and people talking, he's sharing the text messages. People think that he's actually sharing the actual text messages, but he, he's not. He is putting together text messages as though that's what happened based on what Meghan Markle told him. But that's not the actual text exchange. And if anybody ever tried to accuse him of, you know, but you showed the text messages, messages, what is he going to say? Show me where, where did I show the text messages? Just like when he said, tell me, tell me when did Meghan Markle use the racism word? So please, please, that is not true. That, that's not that is not the actual conversation. Those, 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 that is a reenactment. But for some reason, people are not picking or want to choose or choose not to show or talk about it. Okay. So don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe and leave your comments. This is going to be part one. I am halfway through reading the book because first I have to work. And number two, it's really boring, long read, babbling. And this thing should have been called. This, this could all be reduced to one sentence. I'm angry I'm not the heir. That's it. That's that what this book boils down to. And that Harry is a liar. Um, so let's going to get into the book and uh, yeah, uh, I'll read you some parts of it, but I'll give you, it'll be, I, I'm trying, I'm not going to make it that long. This is just, you know, this is incredible for me to, to see that this man still has the Duke or Prince title of the United Kingdom. Stephen Colbert, why don't you make fun of the Native American customs, traditions, and music as well? I think they look hilarious. Don't you think they're stupid? I think they're a bunch of morons, you know, going whoa, 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 in disguise. That's what you did with Tom Hanks, another imbecile, who's, who the queen was so kind to him. They're both imbeciles. The three of them, it's a trio of stupidity because... Having people dressed in traditional uh, dresses, which are uniforms, gowns that represent a monarchy and institution, the culture of the British people, and making fun of it, why don't you just make fun of the Native Americans when they welcome people and they do these chants, they do these dances as part of their honor tradition and their music is very much part of it. So yes, yeah, Stephen Colbert, why don't you do that? I think that's your name, Stephen Colbert. I'm not sure. I don't know who he is, really. But it's... And Harry goes along with trashing the culture of the British people. Because make no mistake, it's like, you know, when the queen, you know, when you got... When everything, everything, when the ceremony, everything, everything, those are cultural, cultural traditions ingrained in the British people, with the British people and the Commonwealth. So don't you think that Native Americans look moronic? By the way, how many did the settle, settlers kill when they came and usurp the United, you know, America, now that they call it America? How many Native Americans were murdered? If we're going to get into that, 
Let's get into that. So people are talking a lot about black racism and stuff like that. Let's start with the killing of the Native Americans who actually lived there and were murdered by these people. And now we have Stephen Colbert making fun of a tradition of the music, of, of their customs, you know, in everything. I mean, how do you guys feel about that? That your culture, because it's not just two guys with, you know, trumpets or whatever. It's a symbol of the culture of the British people, of the United Kingdom, of the most respected institution. And this is what it boils down to. Because if, if it had been up to Harry, if Harry was the heir and not the spare, he wouldn't like that. I wonder how he would feel if instead of him writing a book filled with lies, filled with lies, if, it, if a book had been written about him like that, he would be suing and he would be angry. There would be hell to pay and all kinds of things. So, I mean, what do you guys think? I'm going to read you something here. This is, I have the book right here. I have it on my laptop. Somebody sent me the copy. Thank you very much to my, for my viewer, for my subscriber who sent me the copy. So I downloaded it. Okay. When my wife, oh, sorry, I'm going to go with this. Once upon a time, this was going to be my forever home. Instead, it had proved to be just another brief stop. When my wife and I fled this place in fear for our sanity and physical safety, I wasn't sure when I'd ever come back. That was January 2020. Now, 15 months later, here I was, days after waking to 32 missed calls and then one short heart racing talk with Granny. Harry, Grandpa's gone. So, okay, here we go. Then they say on their website, because they announced, the fa royal family found out because in the Royal Sussex, Sussex website, they said that they were leaving, okay? And they were, the royal family was only given 10 minutes um, to actually do something about it, right? He said that they were leaning for financial independence and they wanted to remain half in, half out. Now he's saying that he left because his life was in danger. This is while he's, his life and his family's life was in danger in the United Kingdom. This is in the book. I'm reading directly from the book. He doesn't talk about financial independence. He doesn't talk about anything like that. So, again, which one is the truth or which one is correct? None, because none of them. Let me tell you, and I, I posted a little clip that I did about a year ago that Harry and Meghan insinuate things so they don't have to, so they can come back later on and deny that they actually said it directly, just like they did with the racism thing. Well, tell me when Meghan said racist. Uh... Their lawsuits because of defamation, even if you don't say the name or the word, and if you imply enough of it around and then you don't clarify it, it's called defamation. That's what well, that's why Amber Heard lost her case. I mean, we just had that huge uh, trial right now with Amber Heard and, and Johnny Depp. She didn't say Johnny Depp was an abusive man, and she first tried to weasel her way out of that one because she said, well, I never accused him. But it... Everything around it and the circumstances at the time indicated that it was him. There was no other way about it. And there was a fallout from that. If the royal family wanted to do something, they could actually sue Harry and Meghan Markle on it in the United States. And they would actually win that lawsuit, just like, like Johnny Depp with, with Amber Heard and, and, and against John, uh, Amber Heard. Because there are enough elements. Harry could have said, wait a minute, when he saw, as he claims, that it was only the British tabloids who made it about racism. No. As soon as he did that interview, LA Times, Washington Post, Time Magazine, CNN, 
TMZ, to name uh, Variety. Variety. Uh, what's it called? Uh, yeah, Variety, the thing from Hollywood. L. Those are in the United States. The Guardian, which is in the United States, had already said that racist allegations and stuff like that. And then the UK press got a hold of it. So the UK press came after the US press. Uh, the UK titles and explosive things were after the US had already caught it because of the time difference. Because they chose the time, so it made it difficult for, for them to react that quickly. Okay? So, did he correct it? Did he say, wait a minute? He told Oprah to say that the royal races was not either the queen nor Prince Philip. As I said yesterday, he could have taken the time to say, you know what? It was a harmless comment that it talks about, uh, you know, that's common among interracial couples, as the entire world pointed out. Because not only me. Pierce Morgan lost his job. Sharon Osbourne was accused of racist because of what she said, that, that that was a normal conversation between people. I think that Sharon Osbourne should sue Harry and Meghan Markle. And I think Sharon Osbourne should sue The View. Because if Harry's saying, if Sharon, Sharon Osbourne was saying, tell me what I said that it was so racist and they couldn't pinpoint it. They couldn't pinpoint it because she had said none. Now, very clear in this video, in this book, that Harry, his gripe is that he's not the heir. His father sounds, oh, Harry, William, Prince William, it's um, Prince William. And if you notice this, Prince William's nickname is dim diminutive, to make him look small, whereas Harold is to make him look big and tall. Willie, Harold. Willie, Harold. Okay? He, in this book, is the best of everything. He, he passed everything, you know. By the way, Harry, you were skiing when your grandmother died. Great-grandmother died. Okay? Get your facts correct. So, you were skiing when the Queen Mother died. The king who founded Eden was not your great-great-grandfather. He died childless. So, just, 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 I mean, those are, <laughs> who bothers with details? I mean, why bother with facts? I mean, Harry himself says, you know, like, why bother with facts? Why, what was it that he says here? Why is he going to bother with facts? No, let's not bother with facts. He's going to give his recollections and, you know, and that's it. He's going to give his recollections and and that's about it, really. He, and, you know, he's going to give his recollections, whether they're true or not, whether they're accurate or not. He's just going to put them there. Oh, my God. He goes on in the book to criticize somebody's writing at Eaton's, a, a poet, a writer. I can't remember the name. Say, oh, my God, what a terrible writer he is. This is a moron who can barely finish a sentence. He said that, thank God he liked Mice of Men because it was short, compact, and to the point. Too bad he didn't do this with this book because it's 400 and some pages. And I, I guys, I'm not going to lie to you. This book, there is no way that was written by the same man who wrote the Agassiz book. There's absolutely no way. You know that um, there's a way of, uh, one of the ways to catch serial killers is the way they write. That, that's even a footprint of how they write. You can see, oh, this was written by a person because of the style of writing, even the handwriting or whatever. There is absolutely no way that this gentleman wrote this shit. Guess it's shit. And I got to tell you, there's a, just a few disturbing things. <sighs> Harry wrote that first he was high when he met Megan, blah, blah, blah. But let's go in order. One thing that I wrote here is, what, that I've read so far, is that 
Megan flew on the 31st of August, the day his mother was killed, to screw him. He had been away on a long holiday with his buddies. Why didn't you ask her to join you? I am sure because, I mean, Megan's role in Suits, it's a supporting role. She was a nobody. She, please go, I, no, I'm not going to encourage you to, Megan's role was a, the girlfriend of the main character. And the story was based around the two main characters of Megan did appearances here and there. So had Harry wanted to invite her to come along with his friends, he would have, he didn't. So when he got back, he was shocked that Megan was there and told her to go to Soho House, got him through. Thanks, Vanessa. Thank you, Vanessa, for sneaking him in so he could screw his brains out on his mother's death anniversary. Wearing her perfume. We understand what's going on here, right? Another thing that comes very clear is that he's a bully. He bullies a matron that was kind to him, who had some form of disability, most likely scoliosis, who used to come and tuck him in at night. And he describes her as mousy, oily skin, uh, oily hair falling through his head, looking and how he laughed at her. He doesn't say that he's sorry, that he feels bad for the way he behaved of laughing at this lady whose job was to look after him. No, he denigrates her appearance, mocks her disability and laughs about it without any, any regret whatsoever. Now, in regards to the military, this man gives almost detailed account of tactics, how they camouflage their camp. The only thing that it's missing here is for him to draw exactly where the camp is. He talks about the type of machines they use, the weapons, the tactics they use. And the army, the military is not talking about this. How they use this bomb instead of this, because this is how you get rid of this bunker, how you get rid of that, what the Apache does, how they record everything, how they do this. I mean, this man, I don't think the military signed off on this. Because in order for him to go into this detail account of tactics, strategy, location, type of weaponry, how it's used, procedures, it has to be clear with the army, otherwise it's treason. Because now the Taliban is going to read this or any enemy combatant of the United Kingdom is going to read this. Oh, that's how they do that. Really? Oh, okay, I got it. So we're going to dig the bunkers differently now because we know what kind of bombs they use. And that's how they're thinking. Nobody's talking about that. How this man has done that. And clearly, even though people make fun of my accent, it says here, most soldiers can't tell you precisely how much death is on their ledger. In battle conditions, there's often a great deal of indiscriminate firing. But in the age of Apaches and laptops, everything I did in the course of two combat tours was recorded time stamped. I could always say precisely how many enemy combatants I'd killed. And I felt it vital never to shy away from that number. Among the many things I learned in the army, accountability was near the top of the list. Ay, buddy boy, buddy boy. Accountability for your own actions is something that you've never had in your life and in this book. Screams, no accountability. I did drugs because of mommy. I didn't do well at school because of mommy. Uh, I didn't do this because of my brother. Oh, I chose this. You know, when he talks about going into the shop and choosing the, um, the outfits, the costumes for the party, native 
and colonials, first of all, he said that he chose the Nazi uniform and a pilot. That was, he didn't understand the theme of the party then because he's native or colonial. So did he feel he was a native being a Nazi or colonial being a pilot? That doesn't make any sense. This book, Accountability, it's nowhere in this book because nothing is your fault. You're a bully. You bully a woman's. She was a matron at the school who looked after you, who cared for you, and you mock her. There's no remorse. Okay? Among the many things I learned in the Army, accountability was near the top of the list. Clearly, he did not learn this lesson. And the following line is, so my number, 25. It wasn't a number that gave me any satisfaction, by neither was it a number that made me feel ashamed. While in the heat of fog of combat and fog of combat, I didn't think of those 25 as people. You know who doesn't think? When killing a person as people, serial killers. Serial killers. That's why they are able to kill so, so easily because they don't think of them as people. They think of them as nothing. Things. Just like you go. There were chess pieces removed from the board bads taken away before they could kill good. I'd been trained to otherize them, trained well. On some level, I recognized this, learned detachment as problematic. So he's basically saying, that the army, the military, teaches you to be inhuman. Oh, and there is a part where he says that he passed his admission test at Sandhurst with flying colors because he was so dysfunctional. He literally says it there. You know, that he passed his flying psychological, psychological and emotional, because they do a psychological and emotional screening, which he passed in leadership, of course, which he passed with flying colors. So he says, so all of you damaged people, divorced parents, check, abused, check. So he basically saying that all of the cadets at, the, at Sandhurst Academy are dysfunctional people, psychopaths who are able to pass an emotional and psychological examination. They're psychopaths who are trying to be killers to feel no emotion. 